probably the oldest dream of mankind has been the dream to fly. Fly like the birds. But the birds, they have wings and we have not. The story officially begins with the Greek myth of Icarus and Daedalus. Icarus built a pair of wings, he flew, but he flew too high to the sun. The wings melted and he crashed. Actually, in 1988, a Greek pilot tried to fulfill the failed flight and he flew from Crete to Santorini. Perhaps the closest you came to the dream of Icarus was in flying this training glider, a German Schulgleiter from the 1930s. The pilot sits in the front and feels the wind like the birds. Welcome to the dream of aviation. Welcome to Sudinus Automobile and Aviation Museum. The dream of flying continued and the first real aircraft carrying people was a hot air balloon constructed by the French brothers Montgolfier in 1783. They owned a paper factory and because of that they made the balloon of paper and they used the idea that hot air is lighter than cold air and that made their first balloon fly. Swedish aeronaut Salomon August André was the first person to put into practice the idea of reaching the North Pole with a balloon. He developed a system of sails for steering a balloon by change of wind direction. Alfred Nobel and the Swedish king Oscar II appropriated funds for his expedition. 20,000 and 11,000 kroner respectively. On the 11th of July, 1897, three Swedes, André, the physicist Niels Strindberg, and the engineer Knut Frankel, rose up into the sky with their balloon, the Eagle, and disappeared with the wind. On the fifth day, a carrier pigeon landed on the Norwegian vessel Alken with the note We are heading east. Everything is all right. And 33 years later, the Norwegian vessel Brattvåg found on White Island the remains of the winter camp where André Strindberg and Frankel spent their last days. In addition to the remains of the expedition members and their equipment and diaries and unexposed film, all this was found. In their diaries, astronomic and other valuable data was found as well. The diaries and pictures provide a gripping insight into the three men's desperate fight to survive on the ice after the accident.
In the beginning of the last century, in France, a man named Louis Blériot tried to build an airplane. He experimented with different types, but not until 1909 he managed to get an aircraft that could fly. That was his Blériot Type 11. But at that time he was completely out of money. He had spent all his and his family's money on aircraft. But the English paper Daily Mail issued a prize of £10,000, an enormous amount of money at that time, for the first who could pass the English Channel in an aircraft. And in the summer of 1909, he managed to fly his aircraft over the Channel. He won the prize, he became a great hero of aviation. And all over the world, everyone wanted Blériot aircraft. If you could fly over the Channel, then it must be fantastic aircraft. This specific aircraft is a Swedish-built copy of the Blériot 11, and it's called Tulin A. During the First World War, we had an aviation pioneer in Sweden called Enoch Tulin. He started a factory for development and production of aircraft, but he also had to set up a flying school. So the flying school was in Ljungbyhed in the southern part of Sweden, which is actually still a flying school after almost 100 years. And uh, this specific aircraft is number 16 out of 23 built for the flying school from 1915 to 1918. This aircraft is a Focke Wolf Stieglitz. It was built in the early 1930s in Germany by the Focke Wolf Flugzeugbau. It was built as a display, an aerobatic aircraft, and flown by many German pilots at this time, and it was very successful. In 1936, the Swedish Air Force decided that it would buy a large number of those for use as primary trainer at the flying school at Jungbehed. Almost 100 of these aircraft were used during the war, to train pilots. After the war, the aircraft were given away to air clubs, flying clubs all around Sweden, and used mainly as glider towing aircraft. And they were retired, most of them in the middle of the late 1960s. Contact. In the Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936, glide flying was part of the Olympic Games. And for the planned Olympic Games in Helsinki in 1940, there was even more importance to this part of the Games. And a standard gliding aircraft was developed in Germany for this event. The aircraft was even named Olympia, but for known reasons, there was no Olympic Games in Helsinki in 1940. The Second World War started in This is the Junker Ju-52, an absolutely amazing aircraft. The first real modern airliner that entered service in the early 1930s. This three-engine aircraft was really the first modern airliner of the 1930s. All major airlines in Europe operated it, and it really built up the international air traffic in Europe. It could take around 14 passengers sitting comfortably inside the cabin and it traveled at a speed of around 200 kilometers per hour.
And this was a great step forward in passenger transportation. The Junkers was built in Germany at the Junkers aircraft factory in Dessau. And they started with the metal aircraft very early in the early 20s. They built metal aircraft when the rest of the world built aircraft out of wood and uh, fabric. But the technology of, that, of its time was that they had to use corrugated metal, which is typical for Junker aircraft. It is strong, it is very lightweight, but not very aerodynamic, so the aircraft were not very fast. During the Second World War, the Junker turned out to be a very good military transportation aircraft as well. And obviously it was used a lot in, in the Luftwaffe in Germany, both for transportation but also for paratroopers. After the war, it was still in use by many airliners until the, well into the 1950s. Then it turned out to be too slow and too expensive to operate. Douglas Aircraft Company produced a large variety of aircraft during the war, both transportation aircraft and bombers. And by the way, it was Douglas that provided President Roosevelt with a personal aircraft in which he arrived together with Winston Churchill from the United Kingdom to the conference in Yalta in the Soviet Union in 1944. This is a Douglas Sky Raider. It was produced and developed by the Douglas Aircraft Company in the United States. It came too late for the Second World War, but it was used in both Korea and the Vietnam Wars. It was developed for use on aircraft carriers, so it, as you can see it has foldable wings. The most impressive of this aircraft is the engine. It's a Wright Cyclone engine. 18 cylinder radial engine with 2,500 horsepower and a volume of 57 liters. That is slightly more than a normal car. The Sky Raider is now under restoration back to its original condition. After the First World War, the interest for av civil aviation started to grow in many countries, not least in the United Kingdom. The British pioneer in, civil, in aviation, Geoffrey de Havilland, he wanted a share of that market. And in 1925, he presented his D860 Moth, this aircraft. It was a very light and very, very inexpensive aircraft compared to almost anything else. And the intention was to use it with the newly created flying clubs all over England. It was an easy aircraft to operate and easy to maintain. And it could also fold the wings backward. So you could just open a hatch and then the wings can fold. You could have the aircraft in your garage, you could put it behind your car, you can drive it to the airfield, fold up the wings, start and fly away. The de Havilland DH-82 Tiger Moth is a development of the successful DH-60 Moth that came in 1925. But with the Tiger Moth, the de Havilland had an aircraft that was very well suited for flight training. And it was adopted by many air forces in the 1930s as a primary training for young pilots. And during the Second World War, all pilots in the Royal Air Force started the training with the Tiger Moth and it was produced in large numbers. After the war, many of those military Tiger Moth were given to flying clubs and they were used as a general aviation aircraft, used for flight training and towing gliders. And it was in use into the, into the 1970s, 1980s in many, many clubs. Today, it's a veteran aircraft which is loved by its pilots. 
and gives an experience of flying as it used to be 50 years ago. They're sitting in the free air, feeling the wind. Here we have the director of photography who is on a test flight on a Tiger Moth. And you can see for yourself the experience and the view he has. At the end of the Second World War, jet fighters started to enter the battlefield, both in the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force. And it was soon obvious that the future belonged to, to jet aircraft. The propeller aircraft has a top speed of around 700 km per hour and it, that is very, very hard to exceed. A jet aircraft has almost no limitation at all in speed. In the Swedish Air Force, it was a top priority after the war to convert to, to jet aircraft. And in 1946, only one year after the war ended, the first vampire aircraft arrived from, from England, from the Havilland factory. And above me in the air, you can see the single-seater, the fighter variant of the vampire. And several hundreds of these were, were introduced in the Air Force in the late 1940s. It became also a necessity to have a jet trainer, so that new pilots could have a jet training in a two-seater before going to single-seaters. So in 1955, the Swedish Air Force started to take deliveries of a twin-seater variant of the Vampire, and this is the aircraft I'm sitting in now. So the students started the training in a propeller aircraft, the Saab Zafir, and then after 50 flying hours, they converted to, to this tw twin seat vampire. And after another half year, they started to fly single seated jet aircraft. When the Second World War ended, everyone thought that now we will have a period of peace. And at Saab, the Swedish manufacturer of military aircraft, they desperately looked for ideas on the civil, for the civil market. And it turned out to be three projects which they engaged in. The Saab 90 Scandia was a passenger aircraft. The Saab 91, a small propeller aircraft intended for traveling for businessmen, and Saab 92, the car. So that's where the nine in the Saab car models came from. The Saab 91, the Saphir, which I'm sitting in now, was designed in 45, 46, and turned out to be a very, very good aircraft to fly. It soon became a standard military trainer in many different air forces, including the Swedish Air Force. It was liked by the pilots, liked by the teachers. It was easy to fly, but still a very good aircraft for flight training. In Scandinavia, apart from Sweden, it was used both in Norway and in Finland. And I'm sitting in an aircraft that belonged to the Finnish flying school. The aircraft, despite being old, is still flying today in many different flying clubs and hopefully it will continue to fly for many years to come.
since the beginning of history, man dreamt about flying. But for many, many people, it was too expensive, too complicated to fly. So a Frenchman, a French guy, Henri Minier, he created his own design of a very easy, very simple aircraft that everyone more or less could build by themselves and fly. And in 1934, he presented his design and his aircraft and in a book that, that uh, described how to build it. In 1935, he flew over the channel and it was a very popular aircraft. People made it themselves out in the countryside and flew with them. There were many accidents, but that was mainly because people did, who built them didn't know to fly. They just tried and sometimes they learned how to fly, sometimes not. The design is very, very simple. There's no elevator. The, the, you control the pitch with the stick, with moving the upper wing. And turning, you did also with the stick. And you moved the rudder. And the, the throttle for the engine. Those were the controls. So everyone can fly this. This is another very interesting aircraft. It's an American-built air cup from 1947. But the history of this aircraft goes back to the late 1930s, when air cup tried to build an aircraft that should be so easy to fly that everyone could take a flight like flying license in it. It has a nose wheel, probably one of the first aircraft in the world designed with a nose gear, even if it came in production after the war. It also has interconnected ailerons and rudders. Normally you control the, the rudders at the rear with the pedals and the, the ailerons at the wings with the stick or the steering wheel. In this aircraft they are interconnected, so when you turn the wheel both move simultaneously. So you don't have any, uh, any pedals in this aircraft. It was still not too easy to fly for inexperienced pilots. And experienced pilots, they wanted the separate control with, over the, the, the rudder with the, with the pedals. But the promotion said that if you can drive a car, you can fly the air cup. But it didn't turn out to be that success. But one interesting feature is that since it has no pedals, disabled people, people using wheelchairs, with can't, people who can't use their, their legs or their feet, they can actually take uh, fly license and fly air cups. So that is the reason, one reason at least, why so many air cup are still flying today. This aircraft is maybe one of the absolute most interesting aircraft at this museum. It's an English bomber, an English electric camera. First flew in 1949 and was the first heavy jet bomber in the Royal Air Force. For a small country such as Sweden, intelligence about the world around is very important. And in intelligence you also have signal intelligence. That means you have aircraft flying around the borders listening to signals from countries around Sweden. Signals from radio traffic, radar signals, from which you can learn a lot about how the air forces, armed forces operates around Sweden. If you look at this model, the striking feature with this aircraft is the enormously big wings. And these wings allow the aircraft to fly at very, very high altitudes, 15, 16 kilometers up in the air. In the aircraft you have one pilot, one navigator and one operator. So actually there were three people sitting in this little goldfish bowl. Five hours up in the air with this machine at those altitudes. It was extremely cold, you have little oxygen, no pressurized cabin. So uh, it was not a pleasure, but it was important. When the camera was introduced in the early 50s, it broke a number of world records. Speed and altitude flew from England to the United States on a record time. 
The aircraft was in service with the Royal Air Force until around 2005, which is also remarkable for an aircraft that first flew in 1949. This aircraft is called the GV-38. It is a Swedish sport aircraft built by a shipyard in Sweden, in Gothenburg. The shipyard's name was Göteverken, and that was the abbreviation GV, and 38 stands for the year of manufacture, 1938. It was a licensed produced aircraft from an American manufacturer called Rörvin Sportster 2000. But when the Göteverken, the shipyard, manufactured it, they thought that it was a very, very weak construction. If you're used to build ships, aircraft are very, very fragile. So they increased the strength and the weight of the aircraft everywhere. So the aircraft was very strong, but too heavy. So it could fly, but not very much more. So it was not a very successful aircraft, and only 14 were built just before the war. This specific aircraft was bought by the founder of the museum, Lennart Svedfeldt, in 1963. He put his name on it, as you can see, and flew around Sweden to uh, demonstrate his skills as a magician and performer, pickpocketer. And uh, in 1964, he should land close to the museum, but he, the aircraft flipped around and turned on its back. And after that, it never flew again. The name Sudino was the artist name of Lennart Svedfeldt. He was a very famous magician and pickpocketer in the 1950s and 1960s. He traveled around Sweden, performed, and also looked for old cars and old aircraft, and that was the foundation of the collection. The name Lennart Svedfeldt was not very good if you are a magician, you should have something a little more exotic. So that, that was the reason he took the name Svedino which also is the name of the museum. The history of this museum is that it was founded by a man named Lennart Svedfeldt. He started his interest in aircraft during the Second World War. He was a technician in the Swedish Air Force, and he also started a company producing model aircraft. After a couple of years, he got new interests. In the late 1940s, he turned to be a magician. A magician and a sta pickpocketer, stage performer. And during the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, he traveled around Sweden as Mr. Svedino, the magician and pickpocketer. And he also got a new interest, collecting cars, old cars. And the collection grew bigger over the years, and in 1961, it was great enough to open this museum here at Uglarp in Sweden. At that time it had only 35 old cars. But it grew over the time and its interest for aircraft came back. So it grew. Today we have around 130 old cars and about around 45 old aircraft. Lennart died in 1993, but his museum and his heritage continues. As a young student pilot, this was the first aircraft you get to know in the beginning of your flight training. With this aircraft you flew around 50 flying hours, around half a year of flight training. You started flying it, take off landings, flying st straight, turning, climbing, diving. Then you continued to more aerobatic flights, steep turns, loopings, rolls, spins. Then you had training in rudimentary training in instrument flight, following the instruments instead of looking out 
needed if you fly in at night or in bad weather. And then finally, you trained formation flight. Two aircraft flying together in a formation, taking off, landing, turning, and some aerobatic in, in formation. This aircraft was used in the Swedish Air Force at Jubehed from 1971 to the mid of the 1980s. The same type of aircraft was also used in the Royal Air Force Flight Training School in, in England. It has a cruising speed of around 200 km per hour. This is the Saab 29 flying barrel. It made its first flight in 1948 and in 1951 they became operational in the Swedish Air Force. The Swedish Air Force had over 600 of these aircraft flying in the 1950s and it was the incarnation of a jet aircraft. And every small boy in Sweden at that time dreamt about being a, a flying barrel pilot. This aircraft was the first swept wing fighter in operational service in, in Europe in the early 1950s. The swept wing were only used in, in the, on the Big 15 in the Soviet Union and the F-86 Sabre in the United States at that time. The Lansen was used as a warplane from the mid-50s to the mid-70s roughly. So it was used during around 20 years. Then most of them were, were replaced by the Vigen in the strike version. But when they were phased out, one squadron of Lansens remained and was used as an aggressor squadron, uh, an enemy squadron. So when there were training exercises with the Swedish Air Force, this Lansen squadron was the enemy. And they were very, very experienced pilots with experienced navigators and operators behind. So it was a really a hard enemy to fight with. And they were also equipped with all kind of modern jamming equipment. So they could jam radars, radio traffic and all kind of communication. So it was a tough enemy to train against. The Lansen was very much appreciated by the pilots. It was very nice aircraft to fly, had very nice handling characteristics and also as I mentioned, it's a two-seater, the last two-seater. So you were two on board, you had, it was a teamwork. You were never completely alone in the aircraft. And a lot of pilots missed really the navigator when they moved into modern aircraft, more modern aircraft with only one seat. The SK-60 was introduced as a jet trainer in the Swedish Air Force in 1967. And from 1986, it was the first aircraft to fly for the new student pilots. And it's flying today and it will probably fly for many, many decades. It is very easy to modify. They, are, they have been putting in the new engines, new electronics, new instruments. But the aircraft itself will continue to fly probably for another 20 or 30 years, and making it the most long-serving aircraft in the Swedish Air Force history. This specific aircraft here, it's one of the prototypes, the second test and development aircraft, and it was never used in the Air Force. It was used only by Saab. Saab used it after the test phase as a demonstrator aircraft, showing it around the world and trying to, to seduce customers with this fantastic blue and yellow painting. So it's a very famous aircraft from air shows in the 1970s, 1980s, until it was retired and now will rest with us here. Here we are in the restoration area of the museum and we have one of the most classical, most famous aircraft in aviation which I'm very happy that we have here. It's a MiG-21. But let us listen to someone who can, a lot of this aircraft, the hero of the Soviet Union, Lieutenant General of Aviation, test pilot, Stefan Mikoyan. 
Миг-21 создавался в середине. Миг-21, FC-104 и G-35 Dragon были аэрокрафты одной генерации. Миг-21, which NATO reporting name was Fishbet, is a supersonic jet fighter aircraft designed by the Mikoyan Gurevich Design Bureau in the Soviet Union. Early versions are considered second generation jet fighters, while later versions are considered to be third generation jet fighters. The MiG-21 was the first successful Soviet aircraft combining fighter-interceptor characteristics in a single aircraft. It was a lightweight fighter achieving Mach 2 with a relatively low-powered afterburning turbojet and is thus comparable to the American Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Its basic layout was used for numerous other Soviet designs. The MiG-21 was exported widely and continues to be used. The aircraft simple controls, engine, weapons and avionics were typical of Soviet-era military designs. The use of a tail with the delta wing aids and stability and control at the extremes of the flight envelope, enhancing safety for lower skilled pilots. This, in turn, enhanced its marketability in exports to developing countries with limited training programs and restricted pilot pools. It would be better if my colleague pilot, the director of Svetlana's Aviation Museum, Bjorn Svetfeld, tells about the G-35 Draken. This is one of the most fascinating museum aircraft we have here. It is the very first prototype, the first test aircraft for the Saab 35 Draken. You can see on the nose it's red colored and that indicates it's test aircraft number one. It made its first flight October 1955 and it took Sweden into the supersonic age with a speed more than double the speed of sound. It was also the first Saab aircraft with a delta wing and it even had a double delta wing to give its performance both at low speed and at high speed. So it was really one of the most giant steps in technology for Saab. And at its time, it was one of the world's most advanced aircraft. During the 60s, 70s and 80s, during the Cold War, MiG-21 and G-35 Draken sometimes met over the Baltic Sea. Our pilots called the Swedish aircraft G-35 Draken Balalaika because of the shape of its wings. As a rule, they greeted each other by wings. They were quite friendly meetings. This is my favorite aircraft, the Saab Draken. It was produced in a little more than 600 planes by Saab in Linköping, Sweden. The first flight took place in 1955 and the last Drakens were phased out as a military aircraft in the year 2005. It means that the Draken flew operational for 50 years. That is almost half the history of aviation. The Draken mostly flew with the Swedish Air Force but it was also used in Denmark, Finland and the Austrian Air Force. The Draken in the mid-50s was absolutely the most modern aircraft you could think about. In a time when the Delta Wing was just beginning to, to be used in aircraft, Saab made a double Delta Wing for this aircraft. And it turned out to be a big success. The aircraft could fly fast, it could fly slow, high, low and be used in all kinds of different situations. It was also the fastest aircraft actually that Saab did produce. The only aircraft from Saab that flew faster than Mach 2. And it was mostly used as a fighter and interceptor aircraft, but there were also one version in Sweden used as a reconnaissance aircraft. In Denmark it was used as a ground attack aircraft. So one single platform turned out to be very useful in many different roles. And the aircraft was improved over its lifetime 
stronger engines, more modern armaments, missiles, more modern radar over the years. And uh, when it was retired in the year 2005, I can tell you that many, many pilots had tears in their eyes. With the Drakken, the Swedish Air Force took the step into the modern age of electronics. It was part of the so-called Streel 60 system, where the radar systems detected aircraft around the Swedish borders. That information was automatically, digitally transferred to command and control centers, and takeoff scramble orders were given to aircraft Drakens around Sweden at bases. The starting up of the engine of the Draken was very, very fast. From the pilot got the scramble order, it took less than one minute to be airborne, and that was unique. And when the Drakens were approaching the targets, they received in data link information. This was a very, very secret system in Sweden, and we were ahead of the rest of the world with this. It started in 1963, became operational in 1963, and the pilot received automatically steering commands, all kind of information about the target and his intercept course and, and altitude through the instruments. So the radio could be jammed, but this data link system could not. So the Swedish Air Force was regarded for during many, many years as probably the most efficient air force in the world. This aircraft is a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. As everyone can see, this aircraft is designed to fly fast, and fly very, very fast. It's a narrow fuselage and small, tiny wings. During the Korean War, the US Air Force asked the pilots what they wanted most, and all said, we want more speed. And speed they got. So Lockheed got a development contract for a very, very fast aircraft the Starfighter. It was built to fly fast, to climb fast, shoot down enemy bombers and then go back to land again. But as also you can understand, it's not very good at turning, so it was a real interceptor. It was not a big success in the United States, but it was one of the great successes for Lockheed in export. So it was used in almost all of the NATO countries. And this specific aircraft belonged to the Danish Air Force and made its last flight in 1986. The Viking also had reverse thrust to make it possible to land on short and narrow runways. And that was a possibility to close the end of the engine outlet and turn the jet forward and thus break the aircraft, even if it was snow or slippery on the runway. Viggen aircraft was designed to be a unity aircraft. The same platform could be used for both fighter missions, strike missions and reconnaissance missions. The first version to be, to be used to be operational was the, fight, the, the strike version that was introduced in 1973. In 1980, the fighter version of the Viggen was introduced, and that is the version I have behind me. All versions look very similar on the outside, but the big difference with this fighter version was that it was one of the world's first, or maybe the world's first, digital aircraft. An aircraft co fully controlled by computers and software. On older aircraft, when you had to make a change, you have to go inside the aircraft, change wires, change black boxes. In the fighter vegan, you just put, or put in new software and then you suddenly had completely new functions. So it was revolutionary as many of the Saab aircraft when they were introduced. This is an autogyro, or also called a gyrocopter. It is not a helicopter, 
and it's not an aircraft, an ordinary aircraft. It's actually a mix of them, something in between. The rotor ahead of me is not powered by the engine. It rotates only by the speed winds of the outer gyro. So you need to move forward all the time. Otherwise, the rotor will stop and you will fall down. It's an aircraft that is a little tricky to fly. It's more dangerous than a normal aircraft. But when you fly it with speed, it behaves more or less like a small aircraft. But when you land and take off, you can use shorter fields than a normal aircraft. For some reason, they are not very popular. There are a few flying around, but probably they are a little too advanced for ordinary pilots. So it belongs more to the history of aviation. The first Soviet autogiri, called the Red Engineer, was developed by the engineers Kamov and Sherinsku, and it flew in 1929. On the first flight, it was flown by the test pilot, Mikiv, and in the rear cockpit was the designer, Kamov. And the Kamov Design Bureau, after that, established a number of different autogiri. During the Second World War, Twin-seat reconnaissance autogiros were used as artillery spotters and engaged in combat at the Smolensk front. Five of these aircraft were used for that. But after the war, the helicopters started to, to gain terrain and with that the interest for autogiros disappeared. This helicopter is a Kamo K826 built in Russia and this specific helicopter came to Sweden in 1970. Now we will go to learn more about this exciting helicopter and let's listen to the hero of the Russian Federation, Colonel Sergei Sokolov. First announced in early 1964, the general-purpose Kamov K-26 helicopter, NATO reporting name Hoodlam, is of typical Kamov helicopter design and entered production in 1966. The fuselage of the Kamov 26 consists of a fixed bubble-shaped cockpit containing the pilot and co-pilot, plus a removable variable box available in mid-evac passenger carrying and crop duster versions. The helicopter can fly with or without the box attached, giving it much flexibility in the use. The CAM of 26 is small enough and handles well enough to land on a large truck bed. Welcome to Sudino's Automobile and Aviation Museum.